The Sonic Cycle. While not a hard and fast scientific model, does carry an unfortunate amount of truth for all its apparent cynicism. The Cycle observes that every time a Sonic game is revealed, fans will latch onto it with the hope that this one will finally be the return to form for the series, only for more and more marketing materials to dampen the expectations of the fanbase before the inevitably lackluster final product releases. This isn't always the case by any stretch of the imagination, but it's certainly been the case enough times for the Sonic Cycle to be a well-known concept amongst fans of the Sonic the Hedgehog series. What makes the marketing of Sonic Frontiers so interesting to me is that it has, in a number of ways and for a variety of reasons, not ignored or broken the cycle as much as it has straight up reversed it. Frontiers instead began with tepid and disappointed responses early on, and eventually, by the time of the game's launch, rose to a fever pitch of excitement amid the fan base, only slightly quelled by the usual healthy dose of skepticism. That's pretty different for a Sonic game, and that's what we're going to be examining during this video, because this is not a review of Sonic Frontiers. In fact, the vast majority of this script was written before the game even released. This is a post-mortem on the game's marketing campaign. A look at how we got here, what Sega did wrong, and what they eventually did right. But there's a lot of important baggage to unpack before we can really understand the public reception to Sonic Frontiers' announcement. Because Sonic Frontiers didn't appear in a vacuum, for all that it may seem that way if you were to look at the release lineup of the franchise. Frontiers is the first major Sonic game to release since Sonic Forces way back in 2017. 2017 to 2022, that's the biggest gap between major flagship entries in the series since the four-year gap between Sonic and & Knuckles and Sonic Adventure. So what's been happening in the intervening time? Did Sonic go into hiding? No way! That blue bastard has been everywhere! He was in two feature films with Jim Carrey, he competed in an alternate universe COVID-free 2020 Olympic Games, he was even a Lego set! The entire rebooted IDW comic book run for Sonic started after 2017, and while we're at it, we might as well bring up that the entire Snapcube fan dub series has happened since 2017. No, Sonic himself was certainly not in hiding. In fact, I'd argue he's been more culturally impactful in the last five years than he has been since the early 2000s, but Sonic Team itself has been conspicuous conspicuously quiet for perhaps longer than it's ever been. Why is that? Well, after a streak of decent games that culminated with the generally well-regarded Sonic Generations in 2011, the franchise's flagship video games began another downward spiral. Sonic Team shipped the underwhelming Sonic Lost World in 2013, and Big Red Button suffered through a tumultuous relationship with Sega to release the comically undercooked Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric just one year later in 2014. There was a pregnant pause after that, and while I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure, I imagine that the members of Sonic Team were doing a bit of a soul searching, a bit of reassessing, really reflecting, meditating on all of the choices that had brought them to this moment, on where they could go next, on what Sonic needed next. And while I'm sure there were many different ideas thrown around about what exactly the blue blur needed for his next entry, the eventual results, plural, would be a mixed bag. Comic-Con 2016 brought the announcement of two Sonic games, Sonic Forces and Sonic Mania. Forces was a new, big 3D game from the core Sonic team, which was revealed with a brief teaser, and, uh, Sonic Mania... Sonic Mania was a throwback to the original Sega Genesis games, developed by prominent members of the Sonic modding community, including Christian Whitehead, a Sonic fan elevated to official Sonic developer when Sega licensed and distributed his PC and smartphone port of Sonic CD. So Sonic Mania represented Sega, allowing fans who seemed to have a better grasp of the franchise than they did step in and take the reins for a change. Perhaps specifically because Sega had shown that willingness to reassess, there was some hesitant excitement for Sonic Forces. The teaser was short, but it suggested a darker, more serious tone and a story involving an all-out war with Dr. Eggman. Though these types of stories have long existed in the Sonic comics, TV shows, OVAs, and indeed in the Sonic stories that fans choose to write for themselves... Good God! It's hideous but beautiful in an ugly way. The games typically do not tell 
these types of stories, or at least they tell them very poorly and fleetingly. So the promise that Forces was going to attempt a more serious story was enough to get some people vaguely excited for the game, even following the recent string of Sonic-related letdowns. And then the games came out. As it turned out, the whole exercise just served to prove that Sonic fans does what Sonic Team don't. Mania was extremely well-received, while Forces was yet another half-baked stock product, with lifeless and recycled level design, anemic new features, and a wonky tone that paid lip service to the semi-serious stakes promised in the teaser, but was ultimately another poorly paced, breezy meme fest. The Sonic cycle had repeated itself. So, Sega's reassessment absence from 2013 to 2017 revealed that they still didn't know what they were doing, and that fans could make Sonic games better than they could. Now, like I said before, Sonic is in some ways as popular as he's ever been, despite the lack of big new video games. The brand has just been present in different ways, with a very small handful of spin-offs, a lot of merchandise and music, a very funny Twitter account, and two feature films, where Jim Carrey managed to turn in only the second best Eggman performance of the last five years. Who posted my nudes on Twitter.com? <laughs> it almost seemed like the franchise was doing better in the absence of actual video games. But lo, May of 2021 brought the first teaser for Sonic Frontiers, and it was... Nothing. For all that we learned from the teaser, they might as well have just flatly said, we are making a new Sonic game and left it at that. The teaser showed Sonic running through a forest. He draws the God of War Ragnarok logo and that was it. See you next year, losers. And see, this is where things got a little funky because that Forces teaser from back in 2017, while it eventually came to be seen by the fan base as a sort of elaborate lie, when it was revealed, at least, it, it represented something. It suggested a tone and an identity. Then Forces was just another game to add to a string of disappointments, and a few years later, the fan base got this. Sonic, in the woods, running. Now, I don't want to suggest that everyone was universally, instantly cynical about this game after witnessing the teaser, because that isn't fair. If you'd poked your head into the depths of the Sonic subreddit, I'm sure you might have even glimpsed some excitement, but in the cold light of day, I really did not witness much anticipation for this game following the teaser, or at least nowhere near the usual excitement that accompanies a Sonic game announcement. A few whispered prayers of a hope, perhaps, but that was about it. As I said at the top, the Sonic cycle isn't a scientific model, but considering an apathetic shrug was all that a lot of people could muster in response to this teaser, we were seeing a big change. The one-two punch of forces feeling like a bizarre fake-out and Mania actually giving players what they wanted was enough to finally send a lot of fans over the edge. Not necessarily into bottomless pessimism, but certainly into a quagmire of indifference. Even if the Sonic Frontiers teaser had been really stellar and shown a clear direction, I think fan goodwill was too low for the Sonic cycle to start all over again. But when all they had was a glorified JPEG of Sonic running through the woods, it did very little to fan the dwindling flame. And aside from another minor trailer and a few leaks that most people didn't even hear about because not that many folks bothered to follow this game closely, the next time anyone really thought about Frontiers was... Oh no! In early June of 2022, as the internet was getting geared up for the annual video game announcement season, seven minutes of raw gameplay footage from Sonic Frontiers premiered as part of IGN's cover story on the game, and it looked... rough. The animations looked stilted, Sonic was slow, collision detection seemed wonky, and there just wasn't a clear sign of what was supposed to make the game fun. Despite what some corners of the internet might have tried to tell you, it didn't look like truly abysmal or anything. It just wasn't engaging in the slightest. It looked like a tech demo, not a game. Sega probably wanted to wow people right off the bat with just how different this game was, to give people an idea of its scale and its new ideas, instead of releasing a traditional rapid-fire edited trailer showing off all of the game's features. I'm not sure that was a fundamentally bad decision, but their dedication back in June to drip-feeding, boring, out-of-context, 
slow, buggy gameplay was, if nothing else, pretty confusing. Why is Sonic climbing this tower? Why is he fighting enemies? Is there a goal? Is this like a big stage? With an entrance and an exit, am I supposed to collect things? How long is it gonna take to get bored of drawing this circle in the ground? That seems like that's gonna get old really fast. There was no sense of what the gameplay loop would be, what a player's objective was, what you were supposed to actually do other than simply run around aimlessly. And things only got weirder and more aggravating when fans realized that Sega was actively concealing more flattering looks at the game. Reporters from IGN spoke about the time that they'd spent with the game behind closed doors, and they explained a bit more about what the core gameplay loop of Sonic Frontiers was supposed to be. They further explained that they'd been unable to capture their own footage of Frontiers, and the footage they'd released had been provided by Sega. It also came out that the game let you customize Sonic's maximum speed, and that his speed had been deliberately lowered in the gameplay reveal footage. Meanwhile, at the invite-only Summer Game Fest Expo, there was a playable demo of Sonic Frontiers. Despite the fact that this little expo happened mere days after the Sonic Frontiers gameplay reveal, the demo guests got to play was from a significantly more recent and stable build than the build seen in the public gameplay reveal. So people were obviously pretty keen to get a look at the Summer Games Fest demo, or any other footage for that matter, except that they couldn't. Sega representatives did their best to prevent anyone from capturing footage of the game and took down most of the scarce footage that slipped through the cracks. Between articles, hands-on impressions from the expo, and leaks, it seemed like everyone who touched Frontiers personally was providing a clearer picture of how the game was supposed to work than any of the official curated footage Sega provided. Frontiers was kind of starting to take on a solid shape in the minds of hardcore fans dedicated to snooping as usual for every bit of information. But for the rest of us normal people, Sonic Frontiers certainly wasn't speaking for itself. In fact, when asked about the mixed reception to the official footage, when given a chance to address the confusion and complaints, Takashi Izuka, the head of Sonic Team, simply said that fans just didn't get it yet. Buddy, it's your game. You released the videos that were supposed to explain it. And Sonic fans, perhaps simply battle-weary over how many times they've been burned lately, had a bit of a meltdown throughout June. A lot of angry YouTube videos, a lot of arguments on Twitter, a lot of people getting into fights over whether this game was secretly good or secretly even worse than it looked. I've seen Sonic fans melt down at bad products before, but again, usually the early days of marketing are the days of optimism. Well, most of the time, anyway. Regardless, first impressions were rough, and with Trust in Sonic Team at perhaps an all-time low, the bizarre secrecy and odd presentation did not fill people with confidence. <coughs> first impressions had already been made. The general feeling among the millions of people who saw the first gameplay reveal was that it looked slow and boring, and most people didn't bother tuning in for further videos. So it will be a long road to win people back over. Ironically, Nintendo did what Sega didn't. Arguably the first real trailer for Sonic Frontiers was slipped into a Nintendo Direct Mini at the end of June with 60 seconds of faster, smoother gameplay and the first look, well, first official look anyway, at the so-called cyberspace levels, which would be more traditional bite-sized Sonic levels located throughout the open world. The Direct also mentioned that completing these levels would net you keys that Sonic needed to progress through the story. So huzzah, a trailer that actually suggested what the game was about. One simple mechanic explained, and suddenly Sonic Frontiers made a lot more sense than it had before. But the thing is, I'm not sure how many people even saw this trailer at the time. I certainly didn't. This Sonic trailer didn't come out in the middle of a Summer Games Fest presentation. It wasn't heavily publicized. It was dropped in the middle of a direct mini, and only the hardest of hardcore fans were hunting for each morsel of news. Most normies had written the game off, and even if they saw a headline about this trailer, they probably didn't bother clicking on it. The initial showcase had been so damning to Frontiers that it took almost the entire five months leading up to the launch to actually turn public perception around from that point going forward. A lot of much more polished gameplay started being released in small chunks as more media outlets got hands-on time with Frontiers and demos appeared at more and more public conventions. And there was a big divide between the early official stuff that Sega had released and what 
other people were doing when they got their hands on the game, where official footage of the combat had focused on slowly drawing loops and dull-looking melee attacks, now people were stringing together combos that encouraged comparisons to Devil May Cry. Suddenly, clips of the game were going semi-viral, and more and more folks started asking, wait, are people having fun with Sonic Frontiers? I saw your tweets I, 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 just after you finished playing it and how, how positive you were. I was like, mm. wait, what? I was <laughs> I shocked. Did not, I yeah. did not expect that because I, I'm like you. I've been kind of down on Frontiers. Yeah, I, I was playing with some industry friends and when we finished our demo, I like, took my headphones off, looked at them. I was like, that was good, right? <laughs> that was really good, wasn't it? And they were like, yeah, yeah, that was great. I, was, I, I couldn't quite believe was I fooling myself here? But no, it was really, really fun. There was still some light controversy amongst hardcore fans. For example, people noticed that some of the cyberspace levels were recycling layouts from previous 3D Sonic games. But overall, the drip feed of footage that came out over the next couple of months, official or otherwise, looked significantly more polished and positive than what Sega had decided to show initially. Now, certainly among all the positive impressions, there were some complaints that not every idea seemed to work perfectly, that these cyberspace levels were disappointingly short and easy to S-rank, that the physics didn't feel consistent, but hey, uh, a mixed bag but mostly positive was certainly a lot better than where the game started. I wish I could point to a more specific moment where the marketing of this game turned around, where Sega released a killer trailer that really got people's attention, but in actuality, I think it was just a battle of attrition, mostly fought by fans and journalists via a gradual rising tide of word of mouth and cool clips that began to slowly but surely turn public opinion around. A lot of previews, a lot of influencers being flown to Hawaii to play the game, some decent music being posted. Speaking for myself, I had been mostly ignoring the game, just assuming that the Sonic fanbase was huffing their usual copium whenever I glimpsed some buzz out the corner of my eye. What got me to pay attention again? It was, uh, it was actually the video where they teased one of the game's new theme songs, vandalized by 1OK Rock. Away, I don't know, it, it was a good tune, you know? The, the video was edited well. Is that shallow of me? Yeah, kinda. By fate or by happenstance, when Sonic Frontiers actually launched, there was some serious excitement surrounding the game. Definitely the most excitement I've seen for a 3D Sonic launch since Generations. And while I wish I could say that's been down to some genius nosedive recovery on the part of Sega, if only because that'd make for a more dramatic thing to discuss at the end of the video, I think it's more to do with them taking their hands off the wheel and just putting the game in front of as many people as possible. I mean, let's be clear, that's still a conscious marketing decision and a smart decision at that. I'm just saying there isn't a dramatic singular moment that I can point to as a flashpoint where things turned around. It's bizarre because while the story of this game's marketing progresses from a whimper to a bang, Actually telling the story doesn't come across that way. The game's initial whimper was singular and high impact, while its eventual fever pitch of excitement was a victory by a thousand cuts. Certainly we did get a lot of good, well-edited official trailers from Sega as they approached the launch. Now all the ads looked fun and exciting, which was a big change from early on. They licensed a Queen song, which is pretty funny, but I doubt a few good trailers would have been enough to get people's attention back after that disappointing and long-lasting first impression. It's been down to months and months of word of mouth, of fun and increasingly polished, well, relatively polished at least, clips of gameplay trickling out, of people slowly beginning to wonder what all the fuss was about, and if this game wasn't going to be absolutely terrible. And in some ways, that really was the only bar Sonic Frontiers needed to clear. Not terrible. The fact that it managed to get to pretty decent by the time that it launched is impressive. Personally, I have to wonder how many potential launch day sales Frontiers lost by not having an absolutely knockout stellar first showing, but considering it sold very well in its first month, I'm sure there aren't too many people at Sega sweating the difference. It's a good 3D Sonic game, a good 3D Sonic game for the first time in like 10 years. Hardcore fans seem pleased. Critics generally find the game to be full of promise, even if it's a little rough around the edges. They have all gotten the word out. That does uh, <laughs> leave me curious about what lesson Sega's marketing department is going to take away from all of this, but I uh, <laughs> can't deny that the game is selling well. Ultimately, things have worked out for the blue blur this time around. And while a lot of people out there are wondering if the next Sonic game will be able to improve on Frontier's ideas, I have to admit, 
I'm a bit more curious what the next Sonic cycle will look like. Oh, that video sure took me way too long to make. Hey Joey, now that I've finished my video on the marketing of Sonic Frontiers, do you want to actually play Sonic Frontiers? No. Ah!